That's great. So this is the I Want to Be the Guy or Gal uh, talk. There's a video game called I Want to Be the Guy. Uh, and I don't want to exclude any genders here, so I'm sticking with the video game theme, but anytime I say guy, please translate that in your mind to whatever gender pronoun that you're comfortable with. This is also the arduous path to senior sysadmin, or how to be a better system administrator. But our titles seem to have changed quite a bit over the last couple of years. I mean, what are we? Are we site reliability engineers? Are we cloud admins or cloud architects? So if the internet is the internet of things, I think maybe we're all fixers of things. So I'm Sean Sterling. I've been a fixer of things for the last 20 years, uh, everywhere from small startups to large enterprise. I contribute to several open source projects, mostly in anger, like when something doesn't work the way I need it to, I tend to try to fix it. Um, amongst other things, I am the guy, and this is that talk. I work for a company called Source Group. Source Group is a global consultancy that helps large enterprise make the most out of cloud services with a focus on security, governance, and compliance. This, however, is not a source talk. This talk, while 100% factual and true, and you should probably carve this in stone or maybe bronze, is totally my opinion. I am not speaking on behalf of my employers. But that being said, they would probably agree with everything I say. I mean, they hired me, right? But if anyone asks, we don't know each other and I didn't say anything. So now we're gonna talk about what I was going to do and then totally didn't. This talk was gonna be an updated version of the old I Wanna Be The Guy talk. And just out of my curiosity, how many people here have actually seen the talk, either here or on the YouTubes? Just a couple, all right. No problem, it's all good. So in my mind, the old talk was five years old, and I was thinking, oh man, I gotta update that because the, the advice in there must be really dated. That's what I thought. But then I watched it, and I was like, damn, this talk is legit. So if you haven't seen the old talk, the advice is not dated. It's still pretty solid, and you should probably go check it out. There's a link there, and I'm, there's a link in this talk description on the, the LFNW site. So go check it out. There's no commercials or anything. I'm not trying to sell anything. I don't make money off of it. It's just really good advice for system administrators, according to me. So this is now part two, or maybe an addendum of the previous version, rather than an uh, updated version. I have two sons. One is two, and the other is five. Both of my boys love the Lego Batman movie, and I have a DVD player in the minivan. Yes, I'm in full-blown parent mode. Uh, and I've seen slash listened to this movie probably more than any other human on this planet. There's a line in the movie where he says, if you want to be like Batman, take care of your abs. And that makes sense if you want to be like Batman. In I Want to Be the Guy is a video game that is insanely difficult. It takes many long hours of memorization and practice to get any sort of good at it. There's a whole bunch of videos on YouTube that you can watch of people playing it, and you should probably watch that before you even think about playing this game because it's like torture. However, if you watch some of the expert videos, it is like watching art. And being a system administrator is kind of like that. But if I had to boil it down Lego Batman style, I would say, if you want to be the guy, take care of your fingers. And this is the only slide that's giving the same advice as the part one of the talk is part two of the talk. And in part one of the talk, I said that this was the most important thing for you to take back. Taking care of your fingers is really important for a long-term career in computing, whether you're a system admin or programmer or whatever. Don't wait till your fingers start to hurt get proactive, take care of your fingers. So the old video's been out for like five years now and has like 24,000 views, uh, which for a sysadmin video is crazy lots. I'm a consultant now and I go to a lot of large organizations and help give advice on, on moving to the cloud and whatnot. And anytime I see a grip master, which is what that thing there is, beside somebody's keyboards, I smile and think, that was me. Uh, so this one time I saw one at, uh, at a bank and a guy was working there and I said, ooh, a grip master, that's cool. And he's like, yeah, I saw this video on the internet and the guy there recommended those and uh, it was really good and it was really good advice. And so he's telling me this story and I start smiling like a crazy person. Like, I don't know if you've ever seen Anger Management with Jack Nicholson. I was smiling like that. And I'm thinking to myself, dude, I'm internet famous. So he's telling me about my own video and giving me advice that I gave him from a video and I'm smiling my head off like a crazy person, and I'm thinking, he's gonna recognize me any second, but he totally doesn't. And so, he's looking at me now like concerned, and I'm looking at him like this, and I decided <laughs> to get out of there quickly before he called security. 
But not to worry, I didn't make the video or presentation because I wanted to be internet famous. I did it because I believe in sharing knowledge with all of my internet friends and colleagues and open source buddies, which is something I think we should all try to do, even if you're not into this whole public speaking kind of thing, but uh, maybe you could do like an internal blog post or whatever, just share that knowledge. So a lot of things have changed in the last five years, and we're gonna talk about some cloud computing, containers, serverless, Kubernetes, infrastructure's code, blockchains, and then some more random advice. And then I'm gonna give out some homework so everybody should be taking notes. I'm just kidding, there's, there's gonna, these slides will be on the internet, you don't need to take notes, it's all good. System administration is dying. That's not on my list. It's wild card. No always sunny fans? All right, it's just me. <laughs> I hear that system administration is dying all the time. And the first time I heard it was like maybe 10 years ago, and it was nonsense then, and it's nonsense now. I also hear that every tech company is hiring cloud admins, CICD specialists, DevOps engineers, and a wide variety of other names that are all effectively system administrators. And if you're a small business, like maybe a local real estate office or something like that, it doesn't make sense anymore to have a full-time sysadmin on staff. And those guys were basically running like, you know, DNS, LDAP, mail, stuff like that. Things that we didn't actually want to do. Uh, and having those companies just have like Office 365 or G Suite or something, a couple spare laptops, and they're pretty much good to go. But those were all the boring bits, doing all the, the backups and manual stuff like that. So I'm not sad that those are moving out because we're now working on cooler things. We've got automation, a pipeline, infrastructure and code, ephemeral instances, cloud services, Docker containers. We got container orchestration, message queues, machine learning. I'm actually super jealous of the younger generation of sysadmins because they get to work on way cooler stuff than I did. I had to spend an incredible amount of time freezing my ass off in cold data centers and sitting in the hot aisle trying to warm up my cold fingers so that I could type again. You know the kind of cold where you have to take a bath to warm up? As a grown man, you don't take a lot of baths, but when you're that cold, there's no choice. So network administrators, on the other hand, the whole cloud thing makes it so you kind of don't need to worry about the whole network administrator thing, or not nearly as much. And if you're doing infrastructure as code, all the networking is done as code as well, too. Until you get a much larger scale, then you kind of need to worry about direct connect and, and stuff like that. But don't worry, network admins, there's still work, it's just a bit less. Storage admins are even a little bit worse, as the whole cloud thing has made it so that I can provision as much storage as I want, wherever I want, whenever I want, and then live attach it to instances. Just like the network admins, there's still work, it's just a little bit less of it. Hands up if you think Bill and Ted's bogus journey is underrated. Yes, station. <laughs> All of this has happened before, and it'll happen again. In the last 20 years, I've seen several technology stacks disappear, and people freaked out about it then, too. I'm dating myself, but I can clearly remember when people were arguing that Cat5 cost too much and required hubs and switches, and we should probably just stick to the nightmare that was BNC. And what was that? Like, BNC, somebody moved their computer and then take the whole network down, or there were like T-connector vampire clips where you'd go to like a LAN party because online gaming wasn't a thing yet, and some friend of yours would take a T-connector vampire clip and ruin your cable, and then when he left, he'd take his clip off and take the whole network down, and then you'd have a hole in your cable and your cable would never work again. I'm sorry, is Grandpa talking about networking crazy stuff in the past again? <laughs> All right, sorry, let's move on. So if you aren't moving to the cloud, it's time to get your ass to the cloud. AWS, Azure, and GCP are all doing very interesting things right now. And don't get me wrong, if you need some VMs or a couple other services, Rackspace, Linode, DigitalOcean, those all work just fine. And some of those guys have some pretty kick-ass services as well, but I'm pretty sure none of them would consider themselves in the ballpark of this, the big three. Each cloud platform has strengths and weaknesses, and as long as it's one of the big threes, you're pretty much safe. And there's reasons why you might want to use GCP over AWS or Azure over GCP or whatever. It just depends on what your application and what your infrastructure goals are. See which cloud vendor will give you the most credits. They're very competitive right now. We had one client of ours who they offered a full-time staff augmentation for eight months and six figures of credits. It was a big client, so they're probably not gonna offer that to your startup with two people. But take your time to shop around and compare features. And then write all your code 
to be as cloud agnostic as possible if you can, which isn't to say you should start things off doing a multi-cloud vendor strategy on day one. Because as Ron Swanson says, don't half-ass two things, whole-ass one thing. So learn one cloud vendor really well and then start thinking about other cloud vendors. Try to use the cloud vendor that's cheaper for you to adopt as an organization, and that's really gonna depend on what you're doing. So moving to the cloud will totally solve all of your problems. And if anybody tells you that, you shouldn't trust anything else that they say, except me. I was just saying that for example's sake. You can trust me. I mean, look at this beard. <laughs> it's majestic. Very sincere beard. Thank you. So moving to the cloud is not gonna fix your broken code. Like if you're running a 20 year old Java stack, moving that same stack into the cloud is probably not gonna fix that much. But that being said, moving to the cloud might actually help you a little bit. Like maybe you're in an old data center and doing another uh, hardware refresh might not make financial sense. So moving to the cloud might actually be a good strategy. You might be able to save some money there. Uh, I work for a company that specializes in cloud transformation, so lifting and shifting is basically like cursing where I work. Sometimes it makes sense, but we try not to do it. Moving to the cloud won't fix your broken culture. Fixing your culture takes a long time, and it's a lot of hard work, but doing it is totally worth that investment. But culture fixing is another talk, um, because your culture could be broken in so many ways, it's hard to give blanket advice that's gonna work for everybody, but I'll give it a try. Stop siloing. This will help you and get you at least half the way there. Moving to the cloud won't make that shifty dude from accounting stop stealing your lunch. And I wanna be clear here, accountants aren't bad people. They just see the value of that lunch sitting there in the fridge and it becomes a little too much to resist. Okay, so maybe accountants are bad people, but not the accountants where I work. Our accountants kick ass. Pro tip, make friends with accountants. They're the ones who handle your paychecks. Maybe they deserve to steal your sandwich every once in a while. Maybe they're sad that you never buy them lunch. So you're probably asking yourself, what kind of picture are you trying to paint here with this whole cloud thing? What does moving to the cloud actually get me? So many things. And there's so much room for activities. AWS and GCP bill by the second now, and Azure bills by the second for its container service. This allows you to spin up infrastructure that you need when you need it, and when you don't need it, you can shut it down. And if you're doing things right, it'll just happen automatically. Then there's auto-scaling and auto-healing. So when a server's load or memory usage or whatever goes too high, it'll just add more servers. And when it gets low again, it'll get rid of those servers. And auto-healing is like a gift from God or aliens or whatever you believe in. If a server dies and it rebuilds itself and re-adds it to the cluster and nobody gets paged, did it actually happen? <laughs> Which, yes, okay, it did happen and you should probably go look at that and look at the logs and see what happened. Maybe do a root cause analysis or patch it. But the point is, we only get pages now if an auto scale group can't automatically recover something that went down and that is amazing. And as somebody who's been woken up in the middle of the night many, many times on a very frequent basis, this is like manna from heaven. And it's hard to get across some of our longtime veterans. What do you mean the server went down and I didn't get paged? What do you mean the entire availability zone went down and I didn't get paged? That's crazy. Cloud services are awesome. And I'll give you an example. In AWS, there's a service for running MySQL or MySQL for you. Uh, and we did the math. So you can set up your own EC2 instance, install MySQL and run that, and you're gonna save yourself about 100 bucks a month. Now that 100 bucks a month is getting you automated security patching, backups every day, three clicks to restore from a backup, and it's concurrent with your old one, so you can get the old and the new at the same time. You can replay your transaction logs in a simple point-and-click interface from any point in time you want. I can't pay anybody $100 a month to provide that level of service to me. To even just keep the MySQL server up to date is more than 100 bucks a month. Hell, I'd pay 100 bucks a month if I never had to run MySQL bin logs ever again. <laughs> cloud also gives us the opportunity for better consistency. We can lift and shift our terrible app into a terribly designed cloud infra, or we can create a golden image, maybe apply some CIS standards to it, uh, and then we get free change control processes because all of our changes are done in Bitbucket or GitHub or whatever you're using, and then we can assign it to have multi-approvers, like, it's a no-brainer. 
And then maybe we can start carving off sections of that monolith and replace them with cloud native services or loosely coupled microservices. And all of a sudden, you're not running that monolith anymore. You're running microservices for all the things. Self-tainting instances are super cool. So what is that? Basically, if you log into the server, even one time, SSH or RDP, we mark that instance as tainted and automatically recreate it within 24 hours. I don't know what you did, and I don't care. If you logged into it ever, taint it, rebuild it. Because anything that you need to do to a server in 2018, you should be using configuration management to make changes to that server. You should be looking at your centralized logging to look at logs or your monitoring dashboard interface to look at what's going on with that server. Logging into a server to see what's wrong with it, that's old thinking. That being said, there's still reasons why you sometimes need to log into a server, like maybe you need to run strace or ltrace or run some eBPF filters on it, something like that. And go ahead and do that. We're not saying never log into a server ever again. Sometimes you have to. But if you do, we're going to rebuild that from a known working good image. And who knows what you did on the server. Maybe you had to install a bunch of utilities and stuff, but whatever you did, we're getting a, a new version of it. And this list is just scratching the service. As of April 2018, AWS has 142 services that you can use like that MySQL one. And the decision tree for us is really simple. Is there a service for that? Can we use that service? Use that service. And if you can't use that service, like maybe, uh, I know in Oracle and MSSQL, sometimes there's some features that you absolutely have to have because your developers have built off that. Okay, fine, you have to run your own services for that, no problem. So as you can probably tell, I personally work mostly with AWS, but GCP and Azure are very impressive right now, and they're, you know, there's no bad option on any of the cloud vendors right now. There are so many cool things going on in cloud right now that you have to get involved or you're going to be left behind. As a father, this slide gives me heartburn just to look at. Those are just glass panels, and water is really heavy. This is an example of not planning and designing for failure. If one of those glass panel fails, that kid and that water are going down to what looks to be at least three stories. In cloud environments, it's not a matter of if it's gonna fail, it's when. And as long as you're designing your infrastructure correctly, you don't even care when it fails. Netflix didn't even call it a SEV1 outage when an entire AWS region went down. Their customers were still up, everything just worked fine people basically didn't even notice. All right, don't log into the web console. That's not how you cloud. Everything should be done as infrastructure as code. Just like configuration management, this is gonna make your life a lot easier. CloudFormation, ARM templates, deployment manager, native is usually best, which isn't to besmirch Terraform. Terraform is really cool as well. And that being said, however careful you're being with that state file is likely not enough. There's a plugin that you can get to back up your state file into a database. That's a good idea. You should probably do that. But then you should also be backing up that database and then copying that database into a bunker account so that, and a bunker account's just like a, another account keeping copies of stuff that basically nobody in your company has access to. You should be doing that because if you ever lost your state file in Terraform, it's not good. Or uh, try to take a copy of your Terraform infrastructure, spin it up in another account, then delete the state file and see what you can do to get that back. Although Terraform also has an enterprise version of it, I believe, doesn't require a state file. I'm not too sure of that, you should look into it. I hear this one a lot. Let's just run OpenStack. How hard could it be? This is just some of the OpenStack infrastructure. OpenStack is stupid hard. Running your own private cloud is rarely a good idea. And you should be a pretty large company before attempting to do this. Now, I'm not saying you can't do it with a few people, because you can, and people do. But the support is difficult, and the upgrades can get weird. And if you're going to do it, you better have 8 to 10 staff that do nothing but support OpenStack. Or you can hire OpenStack specialists, like at Rackspace or wherever, to run it for you. But even if you are using a supported flavor of OpenStack, you're still going to need some dedicated staff to support it. Maybe less, maybe like four to six, but that's not great either because running like a 24 seven on-call operation with four to six people is difficult. Now don't get me wrong, OpenStack is really cool and I've helped run it at large scale, but when things break, you need to understand on how all these pieces fit together and that takes a very long time to learn because there's a lot of moving parts. 
So let's talk about containers. You should be playing with containers, like right now during this talk. And if you're not using containers, you should probably start, like right now during this talk. This could be its own talk, so I'm going to put myself on the spot here and come up with a few reasons. Take that, future me. Now, first of all, past me is a jerk. Okay, so one of the things I like about containers is if I need to test something like on a specific distro, like uh, I have a copy of that container, so I've got like a copy of Ubuntu, CentOS, uh, an Alpine sitting around on my laptop, and if I need to test something, I can just be like, you know, start up that image, do my test, walk away, that's nice. Uh, I dabble in a lot of security tools, and some of those tools are really scary. You don't want to install those on, on your main machine, so installing those in a container, that's a nice, safe way to, to do things. Uh, containers are also kind of changing the way that we develop software, right? Because the complexity, your maximum complexity isn't actually the CPU, the memory, or the networking that you're going to run into. It's the maximum complexity that can fit in your developer's head, right? That's going to be your scaling problem. Um, and containers really help us with that because we can break into everything to, into really small microservices rather than those giant monoliths that were made 20 years ago and all the original developers have left and gone to other companies. So now you're left with this giant thing that nobody understands. If you take that giant thing, break it into bite-sized pieces, everybody can understand that and it's easier, more helpful. So let's talk about containers made from scratch. A container can be made from scratch where there is no operating system at all in the container. In your Docker file, you would put from scratch and then whatever you're doing, you know, copy your application and whatnot. And this can be done in languages like Go where you can statically link all the libraries that you're going to use into the executable. Now this is really cool, but now your library slash dependency scanning is super critical. Like if a new version of TLS comes out, how do I know what version of TLS has been statically linked into that executable? Maybe if I'm a member of that dev team or if I've had access to that dev team's build environment, maybe I'll know. But if I don't, it's just this big unknown. Whereas if it's a container with an operating system, I know exactly what version of libtls they're using uh, and I can update that independently of that dev team. They don't have to be involved. From scratch is really cool for the one percenters who are going to do it right. But for whatever else, you're kind of better off using an OS, especially if you're in a large organization. There are usually so many teams that it's very difficult to track down what one team did to build its app. And while on the topic of OSs, just use the OS of your organization on the container. If it's a Red Hat shop, use Red Hat. If it's Ubuntu, use Ubuntu. Now this might get me some enthusiastic fan mail, but try it yourself. Go grab one of the small guys like Alpine or Rancher or whatever, and then install Python or Gawk or like just some small stuff, Java and then see how much that container grows. You're gonna find it's gonna balloon like crazy. And why do we even care if our Docker image is 80 megs versus 300 megs? It's 2018 and I stopped caring about disk space in 2012. So disk space is just getting cheaper and cheaper all the time and we're talking about megabytes of disk? What are you talking about? Forget it. So don't make your organization learn a new packaging system and remove all the tool set that they're familiar with just because you heard it was cool to have a small container. And no, don't get me wrong, I'm all aboard the security perspective of less is more and making your container small and have less packages. That's awesome. But in practice, once everything's installed, the difference is usually very minor. Should I use a container scanner? Yes. There's a lot of container orchestrators out there right now. And a container orchestrator is the thing that we use to make containers talk to each other and make sure that we have enough of them running and spawning new ones if it crashes or something like that. There's basically three choices right now. There's Kubernetes, Mesos, and Docker Swarm. It would be reckless and irresponsible for me to tell you which one of the above to choose. But since we've established that this talk is 100% factual and true, you should totally use Kubernetes. <laughs> so let's talk about Kubernetes. Kubernetes is also hard. You should search for Kubernetes the hard way by Kelsey Hightower and then do it. And if you're on AWS or Azure, the tutorials for it are all in GCP. And do yourself a favor and sign up for a GCP account and do the tutorial on GCP anyways. Don't make a complicated thing more complicated by trying to have to translate the GCP instructions into Azure or Amazon. Even if this is the only time you're ever going to touch GCP in your entire life, do it that way. 
Now you're probably thinking, hey, wait a minute, are you recommending I do something that's hard? Yes, I am. You should do Kubernetes the hard way so you have a deep appreciation that you do not want to run Kubernetes yourself. And that might sound weird, but it'll make sense in about 20 seconds. Every major cloud vendor right now either has already or is launching soon Kubernetes as a service. Now this means you can just be a consumer of Kubernetes without having to worry about the internals. And that is where you want to be. Until the big three cloud vendors start offering Mesos or Docker Swarm as a service, Kubernetes is the way to go. And this makes for some interesting patterns on the horizon. We should be able to move our Kubernetes workloads to any of the three cloud vendors, and I could move it to whichever one's cheaper by that day, or even cheaper by that hour. It's going to be really cool in the next couple years. So in my consulting job, I hear this one a fair amount. Should we just skip containers and go straight to serverless? No. The definitive answer is no, you should not do this. Serverless is good at some things, but not all things. There are limits in runtime. There are limits in how much memory you can use. And there are limits how much data you can transfer between your serverless programs. Serverless is great when you need to parallelize a bunch of small things, like event streaming, or video or image processing, or having something sit behind an API gateway and write to a database. The whole ETL, extract, transform, load, uh, of big data and data lake stuff, that's amazing for serverless. So if you can go serverless for everything in your infrastructure, Okay, cool, do that, but you're on an island. Not a lot of people can do that. The rest of us, we're gonna need containers or VMs for quite a while. The blockchain won't solve all your problems, and I'm sorry. Unless your problem is that you wanna make a bunch of VC money for your blockchain startup. It doesn't even have to make sense. <laughs> then the blockchain will help you a lot, and you should probably look into it. <coughs> So this is one of the first pictures that came up when I searched for blockchain images. And some of these icons don't make any sense. Finally, blockchain augmented excavators. Now I can have a public ledger that lists all of the places that this excavator has ever dug and it'll be verified by all the other construction vehicles that saw it happen. Or maybe we can get a smart contract to pay the excavator driver to mess with that evil accountant from before. Blockchain's on the excavator. What a time to be alive. All right, it's random advice time. When we started using pipelines for infrastructure as code, I think we all envisioned the one pipeline to rule them all. But the reality is more like this. There are many pipelines doing many things. You should probably have an artifact building pipeline already, or you probably already do is what I mean. Uh, and sometimes, or something that will turn source code into a binary of some sort. Or maybe you have a pipeline that's doing all your infrastructure's code and tracking all your changes already and all that sort of fun stuff, which is awesome if you do. But get an OS building pipeline going. Use Packer or something to build a golden image or golden container. Maybe apply some CIS hardening to your container, install some tools and utilities to make your life easier. Then take the artifact from the first pipeline, put it in a container and that was built from your OS pipeline. And then maybe add some security tools to the pipeline, and we're going to talk a little bit more about security in a minute or two. Start small, but never stop adding stuff to your pipeline, because there's so many neat tests that you can do. We could do unit testing, load testing, performance testing, security testing, compatibility testing. Basically, if you hit an error that you've never seen before, don't close that ticket until you've added a new test in your pipeline so that we can catch that and so that that particular thing never happens again. All right, CI CD servers. So that is continuous integration, continuous delivery. CI CD servers that have jobs described as code are better than the ones that don't. <coughs> Point and clicking in your CI CD server doesn't make sense in 2018. And all that data isn't in a version control, right? Like if I go into whatever CI CD server and I click on a bunch of stuff and then the next time you run that plan, it doesn't work, you know, what happened? I have no idea. Somebody clicked on a thing and it doesn't work anymore. Whereas all of that's code, then it goes into the same code commit, we can have multi-approvers, and there's nice tracking, it's all accountable, that's the way you want to do it. And preferably in YAML for those jobs, now I understand that using Groovy might allow you to do some neat things, but let's keep it simple. If you need to use Groovy to describe your CICD jobs, you're doing it wrong. Agents on demand are awesome, especially spot instances. If you know your job will complete in two minutes or less, it's safe to run on a spot instance. Otherwise, you're going to have a bad time, sometimes. 
And sometimes it'll work. People are going to be confused. Make it as easy as possible for teams to get started. Security pancakes. In security, we're always talking about security being an onion with its layers. Well, who wants to eat an onion? Maybe evil accountants who steal other people's lunches and stuff, but I think decent people would rather eat delicious pancakes. And there's only 189 results in Google for security pancakes, and most of them have commas or other punctuation around it. So I think I'm coining the phrase security pancakes as a replacement for security onion. And I need everybody's help to make it cash on. Hashtag security pancakes. So now we have this pipeline that we're baby stepping our way through setting up. I want to get security involved in this pipeline. And this is going to be outside of their wheelhouse. So we need to make it as easy as possible for them. If we give that security team a brick wall of documentation and tell them to RTFM, don't expect much to actually happen. Get your pipeline onboarding documentation to be epic awesome levels. Make a video with step-by-step -step instructions on how to add a new job and work with security hand in hand to get their first security application onboarded. Because if you get your security team excited about the pipeline and automation, they're going to run away with it. They'll have more tests than you do. Maybe start with some static code analysis for your app, but turn it on report only because initially that thing's going to blow up. And it might bruise some egos of some of your developers, so maybe give them their space for a couple weeks. And remember to be polite and professional about it because we're all in this together. Programming is error prone and we just want to get those bugs out. Also, when you go to get a quote on your code analysis, uh, software, don't be surprised when they tell you that there's no demos, there's no trials, and that the, the cost of the demo, because they charge for demos, is the same for one year of service. And it kind of makes sense if you think about it, because everybody would just be doing trials, running it once, and then they'd have this giant list of bugs to fix. So that's a normal thing, don't be upset about it. And there are several really good static code analysis tools out there on the market right now that are extremely comprehensive. I can't make any recommendations because it depends on what programming language you're using and what frameworks you're using and all that kind of stuff. So next, create a container for your app, even if your app is never going to run in a container, and then get your app working on that container. I heard container scanning is yes, so let's do that. And then set up some fuzzing tools maybe on your fancy new container. Some security tools are kind of scary, and I don't want to install them on all my CICD uh, servers and agents. The last thing you want to do is turn your continuous integration server into a continuous infiltration server. And then never stop adding security to your pipeline. I'm telling you, if you get your security team involved and excited, it'll blow your mind how many tools there are out there in the security industry, and they're going to want to automate them all. It'll be like Pokemon. So share the good and the bad. It doesn't matter if you did something terrible or something amazing. Use we instead of I. When it's bad, it wasn't you. It was a whole team. You're a team player, even if it was totally your fault. The caveat there is, if your colleague is the one that messed up and he says it was we, then you might be getting some of the blame as well. And you need to be okay with that and you need to not go behind their back and play the blame game. Blameless cultures are the best cultures. And when it's a good thing, it's good for the whole team and it makes you look like a team player, again, and the cool part there is one of your colleagues does something awesome and now you're getting credit for their wins as well. This is the Roost laptop stand right here. I have no affiliation with this company and I don't know anyone who does currently or has ever worked for Roost. But this thing is amazing. It takes a minute to set up. It collapses down super small, like before I break it. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Collapse is really small. It just kicks ass. If you have a laptop and you go on the road, you should get one of these guys. <coughs> There's some cheaper knockoff versions of it, but my internet super sleuthing has determined that they're kind of wobbly and cheaply made and fall apart. Your mileage may vary, but I strongly recommend you get one of these. And so now that you have the fancy Roost laptop stand, you're going to need a travel keyboard. And if you've watched the last video, you already know I'm a, I'm a mechanical keyboard kind of guy. And I promised myself I wouldn't get carried away in this section, so I limited myself to just two recommendations. This is a Ducky Mini, and this is my go-to everyday uh, travel keyboard, and I'm in love with it. It's awesome. 
this is a Vortex Poker 3. Both are excellent keyboards and have this little carry case, fits in your laptop bag, sits beside the Vortex, or the, the Roost. And then you can go full on hipster and, you know, look like this, right? Got your mechanical keyboard, got your Roost. Awesome. Though, be nice to your coworkers or coffee shop patrons and don't get Cherry MX Blue key switches because like Huey Lewis says in Back to the Future, they're just too darn loud. In the last talk, I said it was cool to learn Perl, Python, or Ruby. Well, I wouldn't so much use Perl anymore. If you haven't started learning any of the above or if you're on the fence, Python has emerged as the leader of those three, so people don't throw anything, according to me. AWS, Azure, and GCP are all using Python SDKs as first-class citizens. You can write Python modules with Go. This means that you can write your whole program in Python, profile it, and then rewrite just the slow bits in Go. That is amazing. From a sysadmin's point of view, Python's ethos of simple is better than complex really rings true. When I look at Perl code that I wrote five years ago, I have no idea what it does. If I look at Python code that I wrote five years ago, I totally know what it does. It's simple and it's obvious. Google has a Python training class for free. You can, download, you can watch the course and download all the modules. It's just there and simple and easy. You should totally do it. Search for Raymond Hedinger videos and watch them, especially the beautiful and idiomatic Python video. This is my favorite Python video of all time. Even if you program in other languages and will never use Python in your entire life, you should watch beautiful and idiomatic Python. It'll make you a better programmer, regardless of what language you use. There's also a Python framework called Kivi, which lets you easily create cross-platform, including mobile, applications and games with Python. There's examples, video tutorials on YouTube. There's also Python for Kids, which is really great to get your kids involved in technology. I think Python is really running away of those three. Let's be, let's be clear. All right, logging. If you can afford Splunk, you should use Splunk. It really is the best, but man, does it cost. Whew. And Splunk is crazy. It can do crazy things. Did you read about that guy who was using Watson to transcribe his conference calls and then import that into Splunk? And if somebody said his name, a little alert would pop up on his screen and it would show him the last 15 seconds transcribed conference calls, wait 10 seconds, then it would play a audio file saying, oh, sorry, I was on mute, and then allow him to start talking again. <coughs> Effectively allowing him to ignore his conference calls until somebody said his name. That's some of the weird stuff that you can do with Splunk. It's crazy. That's all on, on GitHub too, by the way. Look into logging as a service before rolling your own. There's a whole bunch of good options out there, but if you use a logging service, be mindful of your governance and compliance. Because if those error logs are full of personally identifiable information or patient health records, you're gonna have a bad time. Fluent D running as a daemon set in Kubernetes is an emerging trend, and I really like it. You should check it out. Logging is not a SIEM platform. Now SIEM is security information and, and event management unless your logging tool has a seam plugin. And then fine then, Mr. and Mrs. Smarty Pants. Monitoring is very important to most businesses. Like, maybe we get ZoneMinder to wash the fridge for that sandwich stealing accountant. ZoneMinder is an open source surveillance software package and it's really good at detecting movement and then sending you an email of what happens. And I'll give you a quick story. Back when I used to have physical servers, we were at this co-located data center uh, we had a locked rack inside a locked cage at this data center. Well, we didn't have any employees in this city, and so when we needed to do something, we would have to call their smart hands to have one of their technicians roll up and do whatever physical work we needed. So we didn't want to ever have to pay that because it was like 200 bucks every time you did it. So we had addressable UPCs, we could reboot servers, um, we could log, we had a dial-up modem so that even if the network is down, we could get into the out-of-band server and then do stuff, access console, all those things. So one day a server goes down. I'm like, huh, well, that's weird. So we log into the UPC, power still being supplied to the plug, that's odd. We look at our centralized log server and we get a, a IPMI event that says that it's been physically powered down. Somebody's hit the power switch. 
Like, well, that's weird. Nobody should be in our locked cage and in our locked rack. So sure enough, Zoneminder saved the day, and there was this video of a tech opening up our locked cage, coming into our rack, sticking in a pen, and powering down our server. Apparently, they were trying to drum up sales for their smart hands to have somebody go out and, and turn that stuff on. And then when we told them, hey, we're not paying for that. We've got a video of you actually doing that. And like, that's impossible. Our techs would never do that. Here's a video of your tech doing that. <laughs> so needless to say, we never had to pay that charge. And they gave us some free credits. Back to monitoring. I think you should create a ticket for every alert you get. And while on the topic of ticketing, running your own ticket server doesn't make sense anymore. There's a lot of really good ticketing as a service products out there. And my current favorite is called Zendesk. Alerts should be human actionable, meaning don't wake me up unless I actually need to do something. And that might not sound like much, but you'd be surprised how many alerts you get that is just like, oh, I don't need to worry about this and put the phone back in your pocket. That ain't cool. If the alert was not human actionable, don't close the ticket unless you fix that alert. Actually, I'm going to go back. <laughs> I wrote a little bit of notes here, but I want to say more about this. So by fixing the alert, either you're making it so that alert doesn't happen again, or you need to automate the fix for that alert, or you need to create conditions so that that happens again, because again, don't wake me up unless I actually can do something. So then automate the, the simple fixes. So I used to get woken up at 3 a.m. a lot because we'd get an alert that our database was stuck on a query. And then it was human actionable. I would have to log in and then do a MySQL kill query to get rid of the query. Then it would rerun that query, and then it would work again. It was a bug in the database version, and it was already fixed in the next release. But we were like six months out of actually fixing that release. So after about the fourth time I was woken up for the same alert, I was like, this is ridiculous. So I wrote a quick Python script that would check the time, make sure it was between 2.30 and 3 in the morning. It would check the load on the server, see if it was maxed out, and check to see if it was the same MySQL process running for over 15 minutes. And if it was, it would just kill that process. That fixed the alert. No more. So the alert would still happen if it was after more than 15 minutes, but this would catch that particular use case. So no more waking up over that. And it's simple to automate something like that. Totally worth your time. Monitoring as a service, like uh, Datadog or SignalFX or application monitors like uh, Dynatrace and New Relic are really cool if you can afford them. Now, they're not like crazy expensive like Splunk is, but different places can afford different things. Sensu and Prometheus are really cool if you're into rolling your own. There's a lot of companies still using Nagios. Try not to be one of them. Grafana seems to be the roll your own winner for dashboarding and graphing and whatnot. Uh, it's really cool, and I've rolled my own there, and I'm, I've been really happy with it. All right, so this is never type a command that you aren't totally sure of what's go what it's going to do. And I see this a lot with younger <coughs> folk. They'll Google a problem, they'll see something on Stack Overflow, something that helped one person, and then they will blindly cut and paste that into a production server. Don't be that guy. Paste that command into a scratch pad, because first of all, the thing that you're highlighting in your browser might not necessarily <coughs> be what's going into your paste buffer. Nothing like copying an echo hello world and pasting rmrf slash. Secondly, you need to understand what all of those commands and switches are actually going to do in case it blows up in your face. And maybe the first couple, you know, dash f, dash v, dash q, maybe those are all benign, but maybe that last one is a terrible thing that's going to break everything. So this is just an observation I had the other day and a terrible graph that I drew. The longer time you spend as a sysadmin, the less access you want to all the things. A while back, uh, access was removed from me uh, from something, and people were worried that I was going to be like super offended or something. Just the opposite. It's like, do you want my other access too? Can, <laughs> can I just be read-only now? That would be great. So when you get home, do a search for, wait, why am I talking? Print it out and put it somewhere that you're going to see often and think about it. If everybody followed this advice, meetings would be a lot shorter and we'd all get a lot more done in a day. This is just solid advice. I have some client meetings that last for hours that if they would just follow this would be about five minutes. Salvador Dali has a fantastic quote that I'm just going to read. Have no fear of perfection 
because you'll never reach it. In an effort to save a few bucks, I painted my own office. But because I did it, I only see the flaws. When other people come over to my office, they tend not to notice anything out of the ordinary. In 20 plus years of being a fixer of things, I've been chasing the dream of being a lazy sysadmin. I want to show up to work and have nothing to do. I want that perfect environment. I've never made it. I've never even been close. There's always been something else to fix or something else to learn or something else to do. And come to think of it, I'd rather chase perfection and never reach it than have nothing to do. And also, don't paint your own house. Student painters are cheap and they need that money to buy things that will effectively harm their studies, but give them a good time while doing it. It's part of the process, don't question it. In part one of the talk, I recommended that everybody read a book entitled The No Asshole Rule. Well, this time around, I got two books for you. Nonviolent Communications and Ego is the Enemy. Both are full of solid advice to make you a better communicator and have less ego. Because even if you are the smartest guy in the room, that doesn't mean you should be a jerk about it. Here we have some broken stairs. And when you have a broken step, you can go around it, you can jump over it, or you can use a different set of stairs and avoid it completely. But don't step around that broken step like everyone else. You're a fixer of things. Fix it. And that should be your approach to work. If you see something that's broken, don't work around the problem. Fix it. Thanks, everybody. If you see me around, feel free to ask questions.